Welcome everyone to the Microsoft 365 Virtual Marathon. Thank you for attending and we hope you're having a great conference so far. I'd like to introduce the wonderful Zoe Wilson as our next speaker. Zoe will present a session titled Running Successfully Fully Remote Life Events. Zoe, the stage is yours. Please take it away. Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining today. I hope you're having a, a really great conference so far. Uh, there have been some really great sessions by some brilliant speakers across the last day or so. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you about running um, successful, fully remote live events. Um, and we'll get into that in just a little moment. Uh, so I'm Zoe Wilson. I'm the head of enterprise collaboration and productivity for a, a Microsoft partner called Agilisys Limited. And um, we're based in the UK. Um, you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is SharePoint underscore Zoe, very original I know, um, or on LinkedIn, Zoe-Wilson-UK. But before we move on into live events, I just wanted to take a moment to make you all aware of a, a name change. Um, so the SharePoint conference is now the Microsoft 365 Collaboration Conference, and it's really great to see a date confirmed in the diary for next year. So mark March in your diary now. And thank you to all of the generous sponsors. Um, without sponsors like these, events such as this one that you're joining, they just wouldn't be possible. Um, you know, so thank you. Go and look into them all um, and, and really uh, give them some love for, for being able to put an event like this on for you. So a little bit more about myself. Uh, as I said before, I'm Zoe Wilson um, and I am the head of enterprise collaboration and productivity. Um, so, so what that means essentially is that I work with lots of companies um, around SharePoint teams, OneDrive, Power Platform, um, really helping them become uh, more productive, more efficient as they move into that modern workplace. Um, and I think over the last two months, it's fairly safe to say that I've spent a huge amount of time living, uh, living in Microsoft Teams. Um, and that included actually um, helping an actual government move their parliamentary debates to being fully virtual. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly as well. Uh, so I, am a, I have got a SharePoint background for my sins. I've spent many years working with the platform, um, but I think over the last few years, I've fully embraced all the rest of the collabor collaboration and productivity tools as well. Um, and we do have a very mixed range of nationalities on this. As you can probably tell from my accent, I am British. Uh, I'm from Yorkshire, God's own county. Um, and actually, it's quite impressive to see from the subtitles that the Microsoft AI has improved quite significantly from the, uh, the very early days when I tested this and it didn't understand me very well. So before we get into live events and, and, and a bit more about what they are, I just wanted to set a little bit of the current context and um, just just to explain, you know, why why they're something that have been so important, um, why companies are really um, embracing live events as a way of working. Um, and I think what we've seen with the COVID crisis is, um, you know, not just in the UK, but globally, we've seen um, this huge rush um, with companies having to facilitate remote working for their organisations. And I think in the early days, there was this there was this very early focus on getting um, equipment, you know, enabling teams, providing the tools and things that people needed. And then once that calmed down a little bit, what we saw was that organisations actually um, had to had to look at how they could carry on running their normal business um, using the tools that they had available to them and remote working can make it really challenging to actually actively engage with employees so all of a sudden instead of having everybody um, you know in offices everybody's um, disparate they're spread out they're in you know they're all in their own homes and it can be quite challenging to um, to you know to share information in a positive way and, and have good conversations and that communication is often it often needs to be wider than just communicating with employees. So, um, you know, different types of organisations need to send messages to their customers, to their citizens, to their patients. Um, and underpinning all of this, I think security and compliance is absolutely key. Um, you know, just because we're in a crisis and people need to, to, to find a fast way to do things doesn't mean that, you know, the security concerns should just be thrown out of the window. Um, and public facing events and meetings um, need to continue. But in a world of social distancing, we, we need to find a way to do this um, in, a, in a different way. 
And then I think, one, you know, one of the great things for me is that most organisations by now have deployed Teams or they plan to deploy Microsoft Teams. And that gives you some really powerful tools that you can use to actually do all of those things that I've just talked about. So, uh, you know, why are live events so great? Um, well, you know, we're actually using live events today to run the virtual marathon, which is just for me absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, it's a really great example of, of how the technology can be used to broadcast to large audiences. And it, it provides you with the tools to allow multiple presenters to share their video, share their active desktop um, without needing to be in the same place. So, you know, what we've got here today is um, people who are in many different parts of the world um, in different roles, producing and presenting um, um, using the power of Teams Live events. We're all able to do this in a way that, um, you know, is, is seamless, actually, and, and comes across really professionally. Um, it also gives you a built in moderated Q&A. So um, live events, they're, they're different from a normal Teams meeting because they're not real time. They're not two way collaboration. Um, you know, it's not about me having a conversation with you. It's about me finding a way to deliver information to people um, in a way that, you know, is, has things like mute controlled and, and that kind of thing. But um, it's still important to be able to have engagement with the audience. So if you look at the side of the screen, actually, you'll see that there's a question and answer panel and you can use that to submit questions um, which come into the to the producers and to the presenters. Um, and we're able to moderate those so we can publish announcements. We can publish the really good questions um, for everybody to see uh, and the answers as well. And then in the background, the producer, the production team are able to download all of that information at the end of, of the event and use that to drive follow on materials as well. Um, on demand viewing, this is something else that you get that's built in already. So depending on how you set the live event up, that um, that video can be automatically available for all of the participants to, uh, to come back and view on demand um, for up to 180 days. Or the producers can download that actually and upload that onto a website or into stream or some other source which will keep that around for a bit longer as well. Um, automatic live captions. This is another brilliant one. Um, I mean, you'll notice I've actually got PowerPoint captions on here. Um, but one of the great things about Teams Live events is that if um, if I wasn't using slides and I was just talking to camera, you can actually have automatic live captions. And that can be set to be translated into multiple languages as well. So if I knew that I was presenting to an, to an audience that included some French people and some German people, I could actually set my event up so that even though I speak in English, the captions would automatically be translated into other languages as well. Uh, so live events, another great benefit of uh, our Teams meeting. Um, actually, this is slightly slightly wrong now. Um, the official number is 10,000 attendees in a live event, whereas a Teams meeting is 250. Um, but actually, something that Microsoft have done um, to support people working from home during the COVID crisis is temporarily increase these limits. Um, so I believe the Teams meeting limit is, is 500 at the moment and the live event is up to 20,000 attendees out of the box. And if you know that you need a bigger audience than that, you can actually work with Microsoft to get that increased for a very small period of time, up to 100,000 attendees as well. So this is incredibly powerful. It gives you a, a really great way to get your message out to a very large audience, um, which is just fantastic. Um, and then multiple presenters, um, you can have multiple presenters in a Teams meeting, um, you know, and there are there are a few different ways of, of kind of handling this. But even when everybody's working at home on their sofa or in that, you know, a home office or in the bedroom, um, as long as they've got the Teams client installed on a, on a desktop PC, so not not an iPad or a tablet, but as long as they've got this on, um, you know, on, on a, a proper PC or Mac, they can join as a presenter, they can share their screen um, and, you know, you can pass that control really easily between multiple people. And what that means is if you bring all of that together, it's actually, you know, it's it's really easy and, and possible to produce fully remote live events um, that give you a different and really powerful way to communicate with with your organisation, with your employees or colleagues, uh, with your customers, with your citizens. 
Um, and we're just we're, today we're going to go through, um, you know, some of the use cases, um, how you set that up, and then some of the tips that I've got to share with you from having done this over and over again for lots of different people um, to, to really set you up for success. So if we go through some of the use cases that we've got, and the first one is kind of an internal use case. Um, so this is this scenario is where you might want to communicate with everybody within your organization, uh, you know, perhaps for an announcement or, um, you know, the, the kind of CEO or the senior leadership team wants to talk to their organization. Um, I actually did a, a real life version of this with one of our customers recently where um, the CEO wanted to find a way to be able to engage with with his employees whilst everybody was at home. And I spent a little bit of time with him and with his communications team and with some of the senior leadership team. And we um, we supported them through working, uh, through setting up this internal um, live event. And, and what they did was, um, you know, they, they essentially just had the, the CEO and the senior leadership team answering questions to camera. And the employees within the organization were using the Q&A to put the questions in. And um, I felt really privileged actually to be able to support them with this because uh, it was it was such a great example of really open and honest and transparent communication. Um, and it was incredibly well received within the organization. And um, for the duration of the COVID crisis, they are actually doing this on a weekly basis. So they, they are answering staff's questions on a weekly basis to make sure that everybody um, understands kind of where the organisation is as we you know, try to come out of social distancing. Um, but they also said that, you know, this this won't stop when when things go back to normal, whatever that looks like. They will actually carry on using this technology because they found it to be such a powerful way to communicate and to share information with with people within the organisation. And this could be used for announcements, it can be used for news, updates, Q&A sessions, um, you know, but in terms of an engagement tool, the, the impact absolutely cannot be underestimated. Um, within my own organisation as well, we actually ran an internal leadership conference. Um, it's usually an in-person event, but this year we, we actually ran this using live events. And again, uh, you know, it's not it's not the same as, as the in-person event, but um, it was absolutely brilliant in terms of us still actually being able to, you know, to have those leadership sessions um, and communicate with each other. Um, and then the next one that we've got council meetings. Um, so, so councils, um, you know, typically uh, since the 70s, I believe they um, they were legislated in the UK where um, they all of their council meetings had to be in person. And with the changes in the UK, the, with the changes in law, um, recently that happened, uh, there was a change that said that they could actually hold these council meetings virtually. Um, and what this does, it, it, it allows, um, you know, councils, parliaments um, to be able to carry on um, making decisions, to be able to do that in a, you know, a kind of open and transparent way so that there are no questions around the democratic process or voting happening behind closed doors. Um, and right at the start of the um, the COVID crisis, I worked with the states of Guernsey. Um, so they are, um, you know, they essentially operate as a as a government and a council as well. And I worked with the states of Guernsey to help them run their first um, parliament meeting as a live event. And again, um, it, it went brilliantly. Um, you know, there were a lot of things that we did up front to help them prepare for this. Um, but the, the session itself was um, was very good. Um, it was streamed on a news website. Um, and as with the, um, you know, the town hall example, um, this has become the new normal for them. So um, at the moment, they are still continuing to run their parliamentary debates using Microsoft Teams live events. Um, and that is open to the public within Guernsey to, you know, to, to watch um, and, and view and, and actually witness the democratic process as it happens. Um, and then the last use case that we have is more public facing. So um, in the same way that we're using this today for the M365 virtual marathon, Teams live events is really effective for communicating with people outside of your organisation. 
Um, in addition to some of the um, the other use cases I've been working on, I've actually been running um, live events um, for, for my company as well to promote some of the things that we do to, to um, you know, to customers, particularly because we can't get out to see them at the moment. Um, and we found it to be, you know, very easy to use and very effective as well. Um, you know, so that's um, also incredibly powerful. And it's it's just it's really easy, you know, it's really too easy to facilitate that um, one to many or, you know, small group to many announcements and to be able to communicate, but in a way that's moderated and controlled without someone coming into the meeting 10 minutes through and saying, oh, sorry, I'm late. You know, what have I missed? Or, you know, um, people trying to take control. Um, it, it's just it just looks and feels um, a, a lot better from a, an audience perspective. So what I wanted to do quickly before we get into the tips, I just wanted to take you through how you create a live event, how you actually start a live event. So what that process is for, for kind of pre live setup and how you get the content live and then what that attendee view looks like. Um, and then when we come through the other side of this quick demo, um, we'll go through some of the practical tips that you um, that, that you should use to um, help you run your um, live events successfully. So live events can only be created from within the Microsoft Teams clients. You can't create these from Outlook. You have to do this in Teams. And essentially what you've got is the new meeting button. And when you click that, it brings up this new meeting view, which hopefully you're all familiar with. Um, but what you need to change actually is this little drop down at the top here. So you click on this and you change it to live event. And then when you do that, the form that you're looking at for setting up the meeting actually changes and it gives you some new options. So you can fill in the details of this bit of the meeting, which is very much the same as a normal meeting. And then when you invite people to the event group, you can actually give them a role within the meeting. So you can define that someone is a producer or someone is a presenter. And we'll have a look at what that producer view looks like in a, in a moment, because that's the one that is the most different from a normal Teams meeting. It's very important when you do this, though, that you don't add your audience members here. Because if you add your audience members at this point, you're actually giving them presenter rights as a minimum, which means that they could actually come in and, and take over the event. So once you've set the, the once you've set the meeting details, once you've uh, nominated your producers and presenters, then you've got a few more controls that you need to set. And the first decision that you need to make is about the live event permissions. And what this determines is um, who is allowed to join and also who is allowed to present as well. So if you say people in groups, what this means is that this is people, uh, this is only specified people in group who can actually watch the live event. So there is a restricted joining link that they get um, and it, uh, there, there are additional controls around who can produce and present as well. And then if you say org wide event, this can be everybody in your organisation. Um, but anybody who has the link who's outside your organisation or unable to authenticate will not actually be able to access. And for those two types of events, um, the only people who can produce and present them will be in your organisation as well. So that's just a little bit of a gotcha to be aware of. Um, I did have one customer that I was helping with a live event and um, what, what they'd done in their admin centre they'd actually set it to not allow any live events at all and that meant that they weren't actually able to invite me in as a presenter so that I wasn't able to help them with the event so that's a really important setting and the other thing just to add on that as well um, if um, if your event if you've got that setting that basically says that um, a member of the public uh, can't watch it if that's turned off at the tenant level go change that now because that will take about 48 hours at the moment to update. Um, so the, the last thing that you want to do is start planning for a live event and then find that, um, you know, you can't do the thing that you want because that setting's not changed at tenant level. And then once you've chosen the, uh, the permissions for the live event, um, then you choose the production type. And I'll just take a moment to, to, to walk you through some of the different settings that you've got here. So this first checkbox, this is recording available for event group. And if you leave that ticked, 
what that means is that after the event, anybody who attended it or who was on the invite will be able to access that recording using the event URL. Uh, sorry, no, that, sorry, that's the attendees link. The recording available for event group, that's the one for the producers and the presenters. Um, and then earlier I mentioned the captions as well. So here you've got the settings for the captions and you can see that the spoken language is English, but I can choose to translate that to up to six languages. Um, you also have the attendee engagement report and what this does at the end of the session it gives the producers a report that actually shows how many people joined the session, at what time they came, what time they left, um, and, and the general engagement that you get throughout as well. And then the last one, so this, this last setting for the Q&A, this is the one that is often a bit of a gotcha for people. Um, because if you leave, this, this is usually unticked by default. And if you set up a meeting and you, you leave this unticked and then you start it, there is no way for you to add this after the event. Um, unless you know with 100% certainty that you will not need the Q&A function, what I would always recommend is that you turn it on because there, you have the controls within the, uh, within the event to turn this off. So there is nothing, there's nothing wrong with adding it and turning it off in the event because at least that way you have an option. Whereas if you forget to put it on, you there, there's and you go live there's there's nothing you can do at that point so once you've got all of the settings that you want hit schedule and then you get like a confirmation that pops up that um, summarizes all of the information and the thing that you need to pay attention to here is this attendee link that we've got in the middle so this attendee link is the one that you want to use for anybody who would be viewing the event so if we just think through the scenario, so I set up a meeting for 5 p.m. Uh, for a live event and I have that in my diary as a producer. What I also want to do then is create a second event which will go to the audience and add this attendee link into that session. Um, now there is a little bit of best practice around the attendee link as well because when you copy this link you get like this really long awful um, URL. Uh, and one of the recommendations is to use a service like Bitly, um, you know, or a URL shortening service to, to create a custom link for that. And one of the advantages to doing this, um, apart from the fact that you make the URL look a little bit better, is that if for some reason there's something wrong with the event and you need to cancel it and create it again, you can just update that Bitly link without having to send out, um, you know, updated invites to people as well. Um, so that is um, that that's um, quite an important one. So you can copy that to clipboard, you can share that with um, share that with the audience. And then if we go into set up a live event. So um, what I mean by set up is not set up the meeting because we've just done that essentially. This is terminology that's used to describe the steps that you go through when you set up a new event um, in pre live. So um, it's the time for our meeting. Um, you know, we want to to keep this off. The recommendation is always to start the event early as well. So from a producer and a uh, from a producer and a presenter perspective, you want to um, you want to um, start this half an hour early, get everybody in, do a final technical check, and just make sure that everything's working. So you can open the event. You click join. And then when you join the event, um, so, so it's slightly different when you join a live event as a producer because it automatically turns your, um, your mute off for you. Regardless of what your preferred settings are, it recommends to you that you should join um, in mute. And when you join as a producer, um, this is essentially what you see at the start. So we'll just walk through some of the things that we, we can see on the screen here and, and what this means. So um, first of all, we can see here that this says the Q&A is open. So if I click on this, um, this is a little bit different to you know, what you have in the normal Teams meeting for, um, for a chat. Um, and essentially, when people start submitting questions, they will come into, uh, into the Q&A and can be moderated and answered from here. 
Um, and just a few minutes ago, I talked to you about turning the Q&A on or off. Um, so you've got this little toggle here. And what that lets you do is turn the Q&A off if, um, if you don't want people to ask questions yet. So maybe you've got a presentation where you just want to save the questions to the end. And what you can do there is actually turn the uh, Q&A off and just open that up when you're ready. Uh, and then you've got the little chat symbol at the top. So the chat is um, absolutely crucial when you're doing a live event because this is essentially how the presenters and the production team can coordinate things from behind the scene. So if I look at um, the, um, you know, the parliament that States of Guernsey um, ran, they essentially had almost 40 members of parliament. Um, they had some of the supporting officials who run their parliament as well and the technical support. So this is a very large group of people to corral as producers and presenters, um, especially when some of these people, you know, maybe don't use um, don't use kind of laptops and things like that in their everyday job. Um, and one of the things that we did was practice with them a lot so that they were comfortable with using the meeting chat to um, manage the logistics of the event. So things like saying that they wanted to, to talk next. Um, this was before the race hand feature came into normal teams. I still don't think this is in um, in live events yet, but essentially it's like raising hands or saying to somebody um, you, you've forgotten to come off mute or something like that. Um, so this chat is private. That's something that I do get asked quite a lot. You know, can the public who are watching this see the chat? And, and it's, um, you know, this chat is completely completely private. The Q&A is public, so if you post something in the Q&A that will go out to the audience, but the chat is private. And then at the bottom, so this bit is similar to the Teams meeting, so from here we can share uh, content and as with the team meeting you can share, um, you know, an active window or the whole desktop. And then when you share the content you can push that uh, you can push that into the queue up here. So you'll notice that we've, we're in pre-live state at the moment and we've got content in the queue. And then when we're ready to actually go live, we can hit the send live button. And what so the send live button, what that will do is move the content over here. And at this point, we're ready to go live to attendees. Now, from a logistics point of view, I always find it really useful to have a bit of a checklist so when you're at the point of um, of being ready to go live, the, the producer kind of saying to everybody, um, it's time to go live now and then putting everybody on mute and then hitting the start button. And you'll see when you hit the start button, um, the box changes to being highlighted in red and the status at the top up here changes to live. And at that point, Anything that you say on the microphone will be audible to the people who are in the audience. Um, so that's why the chat function is really, really crucial. So what do what does a member of the public see then or, or somebody who's in the audience? So you'll see that that producer experience, um, you know, that that um, was very much inside the team's client and there was uh, there was a lot going on, really. Um, but if we just open up the live event link from an attendee perspective, you'll see that actually this has opened up within Teams, um, but the view is, is very different. So we've got the Q&A button here. We don't have any controls, really. Uh, you know, we can put the subtitles on at the bottom. Um, but beyond being able to ask a question, we don't really have a way to, um, you know, to kind of interfere with the uh, with the production or with the, the communication, which is, is what we're looking for. Um, and from an attendee perspective, you know, they, they, this is, is really seamless and uh, a really slick experience. So you can ask your questions in the Q&A here and you can see here this is pending approval. So once you ask a question, that comes and sits in the queue um, until a moderator responds to it. Um, the moderators can public annou publish announcements. So I find things like, you know, um, uh, please post your questions. We'll be starting shortly or um, you've got 10 minutes. If you've got any more questions, please get them in now or, or anything like that. Or sometimes, you know, links to feedback forms are, are really good things to put in as announcements. 
Um, and again, until a moderator publishes a comment, nobody else can see a question that you write. And you can also post as anonymous as well. So you've got this option down at the bottom to post as anonymous. So that was a very quick demo of how to uh, set up and configure a live event. Um, and what I'm going to share with you now is some of the things that I've learned over the last few weeks and some of the recommendations that are, you know, that I give to everybody I talk to about live events. And the first one of these is practice, practice, practice. You know, practice, practice some more. Um, just when you think, you know, you practice enough, practice again. And the reason for this is that, you know, if if you do your very first live event, that moment where you go live doesn't matter whether you're in the producer role or the presenter role. When you first go live, it's very nerve wracking because, um, you know, I, I find it quite different to doing um, like a Teams meeting presentation because there's no feedback. You know, there's nobody to um, kind of bounce off of you. Um, you can't read the sentiment in the room. Um, and it can be quite nerve wracking if something goes wrong that you're that you're not expecting. So practice is absolutely key, especially for people who maybe don't operate in teams very much, um, you know, because what what we want to do is make people look good. We want them to be confident using the technology. We want them to embrace it and shout about it, you know, and really drive some of the other benefits that you get from tools like Teams. So another way to do this is, you know, record the practice runs, watch them back on demand and, you know, learn how to improve. So look at things like, you know, um, how you appear on screen. Are you um, are you like, you know, stretching and all over the place or jumping around in your seat? You know, is, is there something that you need to improve and, um, you know, help you just look a little bit better? Um, and it's it's just really good to watch the practice runs and um, you know take some learnings from that and then apply that to how you're delivering the event. Having very clear roles and responsibilities is also key. So what do I mean by this? Well, we we've talked a little bit about the fact that you can have producers and presenters, um, and to have the same person trying to do both can be can be really difficult. I mean, the very first one that I did, I, I did both and it was just the, the most scary, awful thing that I've done, really. Um, so have clear roles and responsibilities, have a backup plan, you know, have two producers. I've been in multiple events where things have gone wrong and, uh, and the second producer has had to take over, um, you know, um, and, and send something live or change the screen or, or something like that. So absolutely have clear roles and responsibilities, have a plan know who needs to do what and where and practice and practice and make sure that people know exactly what they need to do and that they're really comfortable with it. And plan for contingencies as well. You know, so the more you do this, the more you will come across situations where things are not going to work as expected. So, um, you know, some of the things that I've seen so far, um, a presenter with um, a dodgy network connection and um, they, they, we, there was myself and a couple of other producers who were all trying to send this person live and because um, because of their network connection that there wasn't enough bandwidth for their camera to actually go live so um, you know we, what we learned after that one was that actually what you should do is for every presenter that you've got have a have a slide with a picture of them on. And if you've got a problem sending their picture live, their, their, their camera live, go to the picture instead, because that way, you know, at least um, people can still see who's talking. Um, and, you know, plan for what will happen if the primary presenter loses their, um, it loses their connection. Will there be a, kind of a secondary way of communicating? You know, how, how will that person let one of the other producers know, know what's happening? Um, you know, what happens if someone's computer dies partway through? Um, you know, it, you need to think through these things. And, and the, the bigger the event is and the more important it is, the more you need to practice and plan for what you do if things go, go wrong. And, you know, sometimes you, you just have to you just have to laugh it off. You know, I um, I mean, I did one of these yesterday and I accidentally muted myself trying to show something off around accessibility. You know, so we, even though I use this every day and I'm, I'm telling other people how to use it, I can still do things wrong. 
And, you know, we're, we're all human. We're, we're all working in a, a really weird way at the moment. You know, lots of people are kind of working with uh, with pets and kids and family and, you know, noisy homes and, and things like that. And, and even with all of the practice that you do, things still might go wrong, you know, and I think um, we all just need to kind of not take it too seriously, you know, and if someone forgets to come off mute, if they forget to put their camera on, you just have to laugh it off a little bit, you know, and um, all be forgiving and understanding of each other. So um, I mentioned earlier joining the live event early. What you can see on this screen at the moment is a holding slide I created for a um, like a webinar that we did. And um, I had a little ticker that ran along the bottom. And what we did was we actually started the live event about five or ten minutes early because you know, you know what people are like. If they're bored, they're going to join a meeting early. And when you join a Teams live event, if you join before the event started, you just get this really horrible grey screen that says this live event has not started yet. And um, you know, by taking a few minutes to just put together a holding slide and maybe a little bit of ticker and you can put some like cheesy elevator music over the top of it. It just gives that kind of lobby uh, feel to it, you know, which just lo looks a little bit more professional and then be ready to start exactly, um, you know, on the, on the agreed start time as well. Uh, so I've mentioned muting already. Uh, remember, good mute and camera control. And this is something else that will come out of the practice. Um, you know, so it doesn't matter if people are practicing with their peers and they forget to turn their camera on or off or their mute. Um, they can do it a few times in a practice environment and it starts to become second nature so that they just do it automatically. Now, one thing to be aware of with live events is that there is a limit for the amount of cameras that a producer can see and interact with. So if you've got 20 people who join a live event and all of them put their camera on, only the first nine of them, so the first nine people to put their camera on, will be visible to the producer. So what that means is that if everybody just comes on and puts their camera on straight away, then actually they won't all be able to go live with their camera on. So again, um, you know, part of the discipline of handing over control to someone is actually knowing to put camera, put camera on, turn mute, or take mute off and, you know, put yourself so that people can hear you. And then when you finish talking, turn them both off. So, so go back on mute, turn your camera off. Um, just so that the presenters, that the producer can continue to actually control the events. Number seven, another good reason why you want to practice tech test. So what do we mean by that? Microphones, sound quality, speakers, cameras, lighting. Um, Things like, you know, is the person who's presenting sat in front of this giant window with like, um, you know, this aura of light just covering their entire face or, uh, you know, is the camera at the wrong height? Have they got things behind them that they wouldn't want to have on screen? Um, does their microphone work? Do their speakers work? And the, the further in advance that you can test this, the more time you have to fix it, you know, whether that's sending them equipment or setting up one on one sessions as well. Number eight, so that's a delightfully flattering photo of me, but make sure the camera is at the right height. I can't, I've lost count of the amount of meetings I've been in or events where you're essentially looking up someone's nose or, you know, you've got this kind of giant space above their head. Um, so another part of the tech test that you want to do is to make sure that the camera is at the right height and that it's flattering as well, because, again, this can be quite scary for people. And if you're getting them in front of a camera and you've got them live streaming for the first time, you want to make them look good. You want to help them succeed, you know, and you, you want to set them up for success. And there are just little things that you can do around things like camera height, lighting and, and that kind of thing that, you know, can can really help with that process. Number nine, two monitors for the producer. Now, I think it would be absolutely incredibly difficult to try to produce an event if you've only got one screen. Um, there can be quite a lot of moving parts to keep track of. 
so having having two monitors is is really important and i think sometimes it can be useful to have almost the secondary device as well you know so maybe a tablet or, or some other computer set up where you've got the attendee view playing just so you can see with a slight delay what the audience is seeing and it, it will flag up if there is something that's wrong and then the last of the 10 tips that I've got for you is background effect screens. So you can see here this um, corporate background that, um, you know, that my company have created. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the really fun ones that people are using. Um, you know, there are some great ones out there. Um, but again, you know, if we want people to be comfortable being on camera, this is a really simple way that you can do that by, um, you know, helping people hide their surroundings, not feel self-conscious of, you know, the, the place that they're in or, or their, you know, their living arrangements or anything like that. Um, and again, it just provides a bit of a more professional um, look and feel as well. So this is an absolutely brilliant one. There are loads of tips and tricks online for how to add custom backgrounds into the um, like the hidden folders that Teams picks up from as well. So, you know, if, if you don't use these already, I'd highly recommend you go and have some fun with them. Bonus tip. So I know I've said this already. I'm coming back to it because this is the most important thing that you can do. Every other tip that I've provided will come out of practicing. So the more that you practice, the more that you test, the more that you'll find the things that are going to actually trip you up on the day as well. Uh, and I'm just going to leave this on the screen. Um, have we got any questions? Have a look. No, not so far. Perfect, okay. So um, I won't go through all of these again. This is just to summarise some of the tips that we've got, but all of this information will be uh, will be shared afterwards um, as well. And as I said at the start, feel free to reach out to me. I, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is SharePoint underscore Zoe. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's Zoe dash Wilson dash UK. Um, you know, get in touch if you've got any questions. If you're trying this for the first time and, you, you, you know, you're getting stuck and you just want to see where you're going wrong, um, you know, get in touch. I'm more than happy to help um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions 